I think we can safely say that uh, Brian is one of the most prolific libertarians during the last 30 years. He's certainly turned out over the last, and uh, he always writes well. Um, I think Brian and me did fall out once over his uh, televised t history of the world because I said that you know, if he wants to be president of the world, he shouldn't be talking to us. Brian thought that was a silly thing to say. But anyhow, I did say before I said that that it was well written. Everything I've read mm. by Brian yeah. is well written. And so uh, his prolific output has been well written. So uh, <laughs> with well, that, I... I can, uh, can I guess, well, since you've mentioned this ruling of the world <laughs> thing, I think I'm, I'm going to have to reply to that. First of all, um, I have withdrawn my candidacy. You'll be relieved to hear. <laughs> but but my, my, the serious point was that, that I believe the world is... was. I believe then and I believe now that the world is heading inexorably towards rule by a global elite. And I, I just think that uh, the people doing that ought not to be um, bad people. They should be people like myself. They should be good people. Yes. They should be wise, virtuous people. Uh, and actually, um, whereas for many libertarians, the, the, what gets them started is the question, how can I get these bastards off my back? And what is the argument against health and safety laws, which I already know I hate? In other words, you start with your own personal situation and you, you're not... The last thing on your mind is exercising power over others. What's on your mind is the people who are exercising power over you and you want some arguments to tell them to get stuffed. But for, for other libertarians, uh, especially with my kind of background, class background, the question is not um, how can I carve out a, a minimum of comfort and freedom for myself. It's how should the world be ruled by people such as myself, my family, my ancestors, my cousins, my cousin owns a stately home. You know, how, what sort of rules should we all follow when we're, when we're, when we're uh, governing the planet? And libertarianism is also the answer to that question. I mean, I'm being frivolous because it is a bit No, I think you're... Comical, I, think, I, think, I, think, I agree with your point, but I, I would say, of course, that there should be no rules. Yes, well, the, the, the question, what sort of rules should prevail, yes. you know, what, what principles should we all follow? And even if you are at the top end of society, the statement that, you, that people generally should have freedom is a good one, because people, if only because they'll hate you less. They won't, they won't want to kill you if you use what power you have to maximise human liberty rather than to reduce it. Um, so that was the serious proposition that uh, was embodied in that, that book. Um, but I also thought technology was, was, this was way before the internet, I also thought technology was inexorably causing the world to divide not along national lines any longer, but along ideological lines, so that all the libertarians in one country would be, would feel much more in common with other libertarians in other countries than, yes, than, you than never the thought this, You had never thought this a hundred years earlier and more. Uh, Karl Marx. I was aware of that, <laughs> and I, dis I discussed the whole business of why... Um, that was how it looked in 1848 and why he was disappointed. I mean, it was... It, anyway, that's what that was about. Um, at the same time, I, I, I can remember quite vividly, I was... I was the, the process of becoming a libertarian was all mixed up with the process of arguing through what I've just been talking about. But it was also all mixed up with architecture because one of the things I was was an architecture student. Um, and I can't separate the process of becoming a libertarian from the process of working out what I thought about modern architecture, especially modern architecture, and contemporary architecture. Now, um, and, and, and ever since then, I've been interested in the latest buildings and uh, who's building them, what they look like, and all that. And most recently, with the arrival of cheap digital photography, I've been able to uh, photograph these things, and that's been a great deal of fun as well. Uh, so I'm an architecture fan. I thought I might be an architect, but the, you know, it's, quite, it's one thing to appreciate a good game and quite another to be able to score brilliant goals. And I realised, um, just as I realised I had no talent for politics uh, of the usual sort, I also realised I had no talent as an architect. But that doesn't mean you can't be interested in the subject and have worthwhile things to say about it. Now, in that sort of spirit, I, I recently had a... I say recently, it must have been about two or three years ago, I had a recorded conversation... Uh, between, it was between me and Patrick Crozier about architecture. And in it, I covered quite a lot of the sort of things I've got on my notes here. But the thing began with Patrick Crozier's theory of modern architecture, which was very simple. 
and he's forgotten about it, but I listened to the conversation again this afternoon. It goes like this. From the year zero, way back in the dim mists of the past, until 1950, architecturally, everything was just fine. Buildings were beautiful, people were happy, architects were sensible, all was wonderful. And then, for reasons nobody can, we can only speculate about, architecture descended from splendor to appallingness. And for the next three, deca for the next three decades, archi architecture was abysmal. Um, and then in about 1980, it started improving and it's been in a convalescent state ever since. Now, this theory has one, it, I think, one great advantage over quite a few others that uh, one could think of, which is that I think it's probably quite widely believed in. I think it's quite a popular story of, of modern architecture. Everything was fine. Then the damn architects screwed everything up with their insane buildings. And then after a bit, they got fed up with being insulted at parties by people whose lifts didn't work. And they said, well, all right, then we'll try and make our buildings look a bit less horrible and a bit more, you know, cool. They'll still be modern, but they won't be quite so ghastly. Um, that's one sort of theory of, of the whole story. Here's another. I, I, this is a book by Charles Jenks, and it's called Modern Movements in Architecture. And the movements in question are numerous and complicated. Now, I don't know if you can see that. Probably not. But it looks like a chart of life on Earth throughout its entire history of evolution. It's one of those sort of charts, you know, with sort of complicated e uh, meanderings and, and, and sub-movements, things like functionalism. I'm, I'm just reading the big words now. Heroic, Beaux-Arts, utopian, folk, unselfconscious, revival, war, minimal, consumer, modern, mobile, ad hocism, pop, bureaucratic, parametric, whatever that means. In other words, it's complicated. And in many ways, this book was written, and it was written at about uh, the time when things began to change. I think it was about, I think it was published in about 1980, that sort of time. When was it published? Let's find out. Yes, here we are, London, November 1983. That's the introductory uh, piece, uh, early 80s. He was, I think, reacting to Crozier's theory of architecture, which he was having shoved down his throat by everybody he ever met. That's my theory. I don't know, but that, that's how it reads to me. Uh, and, and so his theory is it's massively complicated. You just can't generalise about it. That's what people always do when they're, on re when they're in retreat, when they and their friends have just made horrible mistakes and uh, they want to um, kind of wriggle out of it and shed a few of their friends quietly without being too public about it. They say, oh, it's complicated. You know, why did you start the Second World War, Mr. So-and-so? It's complicated. Why did you, wh why did you neglect um, this terrorist incident? It's complicated. That's what people say when they are trying to get out of an awkward accusation, which to some extent I think Charles Jenks is trying to do. He's trying to do that on behalf of modern architecture. He's trying to say, look, there's more to it than just horrible tower blocks with lifts that don't work. It's a, it's a much more complicated, interesting, and actually quite uh, admirable story. And he has a good point. I mean, it, clearly there is much more going on in the history of modern architecture than just a few dreary concrete towers in London. Uh, it's just hugely more interesting than that and, and more fun. But, um, you know, this is London, and we're who we are, and... Uh, I think of the two propositions I put to you, Crozier's bing bong bing theory and Jenks's it's complicated theory, I prefer Crozier. I think it's I think it's better. I think it's actually more accurate. And I will now offer a slightly souped up version of Crozier, but it's nearer to Crozier than it is to Jenks. And I start. Well, I use the. I, first of all, I use the. I just want to justify my title, which is something to do with theses, antitheses, and thin, syntheses in modern architecture, right? Yeah, well, at first, uh, there was a time about a week ago when I was saying, "Oh God, I wish I hadn't chosen this title. How am I going to? How am I going to talk about that? You know, I, can't I just talk about stuff? You know, modern architecture, one thing after another." But then I, I thought, well, I ought to justify the choice of title. And by the time I'd finished justifying it to myself. I realise it's actually quite a good title. If by thesis you mean something academic, 
and detached and relaxed and no problem, then it's not that. But if, if on the other hand, you know you're Hegel, and you know that thesis, antithesis, and synthesis refers to a world of historical upheaval and turmoil and disaster and death and doom and frustrated hopes and uh, triumphs and, and disasters of every sort, well, then, now you're talking. And the point is that architecture is a very fraught activity. It's a, it's a big deal. I mean, imagine what art would be like. Imagine what painting would be like as an art if every time the National Gallery acquired a new painting, it had to destroy an old one. I mean, just think about that. OK, that doesn't happen always with architecture. Often they're built out in open fields, and often the buildings that are destroyed to make way for new buildings are utterly uh, losable. Nobody, nobody cares. But just think, you know, Theodore Dalrymple, the British Conservative, was talking about how not long ago he was in a northern city in, in England, and he was in a shop, and they had lots of photographs on, on the walls of, of the architecture of this town before the Second World War. This sort of rather grand, a bit sort of doom-laden, but rather splendid Victorian mansions and, and housing estates and back-to-back -back, uh, smaller houses, you know. And he said to the shopkeeper, isn't it terrible what, what Hitler did to this country? And, and, of course, the shopkeeper said, Hitler, what are you talking about? That was the damn council. They destroyed it. Whereas you can take or leave Stockhausen and continue to listen to Haydn symphonies, if that's your preference, which is the usual libertarian line on these things, after all, isn't it? Each to his own. What's the problem? Uh, why make a fuss about different tastes? Architecture, by its nature seems to do more than that. It, it, it seems to bash its way on top of your tastes and as in the process of asserting somebody else's tastes. It does seem to do that, and I don't really think it could be otherwise. I, I don't think in a libertarian world it'd be that different, because I think people are going to be able to buy up cheap houses, and other people are going to regret their passing very much, but they're going to build big new buildings. I think that, that, that's how it'll be. In, in, in any imaginable libertarian world that I can think of, and, unless the economy is completely stagnating, which I don't think it would be. So it is, a, it is a fraught matter, and that's why I am happy in the end with this title of the idea of clashing trends, of, of great armies just bashing into each other. I don't want to imply that all architects are fully paid up members of this team or that team or this team or that team. That's not how it works. Architects duck and weave, they get jobs where they can. Uh, they're a bit like, uh, I, I used a classical music uh, reference just recently, uh, just a moment ago, I'm a fan of classical music. It's, it's rather like being a conductor of symphony orchestras, being a, an ambitious conductor. You have to make the right political noises to whoever decides these things to get your hands on an orchestra. I mean, think of the trouble that all those German conductors in the mid-20th century had, ducking and weaving their way past Adolf Hitler, trying to, on the one hand, if, they, if the Nazis were willing to offer them a job, well, good, but on the other hand, they didn't want to be too kind of obviously pro-Nazi and they didn't want to be photographed in 1945 standing next to Himmler or something, you know. I'm thinking of people like Herbert von Karajan, Furt Wengler, uh, Karl Böhm, who gets a completely free ride from, mm -hmm. from what I've heard, although he was a far more devoted Nazi than Karajan ever was. Karajan drove helicopters, in my opinion, that's why everybody thinks he's a Nazi. I digress, but my point is, this is a public art. Architects often made political noises and gave out political proclamations to get a chance to make buildings. That's what they care about. Just and carry on the conductor, gets an orchestra and can conduct it. Architects are like that. So don't equate what I'm about to offer as architects... Um, uh, you know, clashing as fully paid up members of one team. It doesn't work like that. But the tendencies, the sort of, if you like, the ideas which I see in collision, I've got them listed here. Number one is traditional. That's, that's everything, not everything before 1950. I would want to go back to more like 1870 or 1880. I would date the first modern buildings from then. And my second category is the modern building that started being done then, and I've christened it here, Evolving Modern. Now, 
That means the first skyscrapers, basically. They were built in Chicago. I think the first one was built in 1883. This, this book here, which is a book about skyscrapers, shaped like a skyscraper, as it has to be to accommodate the pictures, there's, there's one in there. I mean, that's the sort of building that we're talking about. That was built, I think, more like 1925 or 30, that sort of time. But those are the, those are the first definitely modern pieces of architecture. And as libertarians, we don't, I mean, I'm not assuming everybody here is a libertarian, but I, I get the feeling most of us present here are, and that's probably the case also with most watching this video. Libertarians are very good at understanding how that happened. It happened because of economic pressures. It happened because property rights were taken seriously. I mean, basically you had a site. You couldn't just smash down the buildings on all, in all directions and expand sideways. That's not allowed, it's illegal. Those people own their sites. You've got this site, there's only one way to go to fit many more people in it than, than you did before, and that's up. And so there's, you get this classic profile of an American city center, which is like an economic graph of, of land prices, and which is a, also a measure of how very, very much people and those who arrange for people to work in a particular place want people to be in this particular spot. City centers, are very, very desirable places to, to, to set up a, a business. And Chicago was the first of these great cities. It, it was basically a great big uh, food processing uh, place. The whole contents of, seemingly the whole contents of the middle of the United States would descend on, on Chicago every day in trains, would be sliced up, refrigerated, processed, tinned, uh, put, put in cans as they call it over there, uh, and and then sent out to the rest of, the, of America. And uh, all of this required lots of pen pushers to keep track of it all. And so you had skyscrapers to accommodate all these people. And they wanted to be near each other because that's much better. Again, as libertarians, we, I don't have to explain to you why different, why particular trades all have a tendency to cluster together. You know, they all have the same suppliers, they share gossip with each other. It's something that happens all the time. There are, whole, there are lots of districts in London, and I'm sure it's true in every city on the planet, where, you know, the lawyers, the lawyer there, lawyers congregate in one particular part of town, the theatrical types in another, and, 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 the, and the property developers, or the, you know, the jewelers, the, the couturiers, the fashion people. They all have their little districts, and financial districts are no different. So, so that's why you have tower blocks. And that happened in America, and it happened because it made sense to happen. The technology made sense. Uh, it, was, it was the same technology that was being used for those railways. What they did was they took those long strips of metal and stuck them in the sky. That's how they did it. Um, the railways came first, and, and they had to use a radical new technology. That's the important thing. And this created a whole new atmosphere. You know, people saw these new buildings. Jesus. Well, what is that? You know, they would see this thing that was that small at the bottom and that tall. I mean, this, th this is... OK, a few ecclesiastical miracles have been contrived along those lines, but we're talking sort of 20 storeys high. I mean, they were, they were huge objects. And um, people knew that this was something different and special and, and new. Uh, uh, you might say a new spirit was afoot in, in architecture. Category number three. Number one, we've got uh, traditional. Number two, evolved modern. Number three, imposed modern is what I've called it here. Now that's the Europeans. And it's also the communists as well. It's, it's socialism. You, you cannot separate the modern movement in architectural thinking and visualizing and imagining from the collectivist movement. It, it, it is inherently collectivist. I mean, for a start, um, there's nothing like the same respect for property rights. The whole point is that property rights are getting in the way. We, the great architects of, of, of Europe, are going to um, seize hold of this thing that those vulgar and rather confused and money-grubbing Americans have blundered into capitalism, all these towers, we're going to grab hold of it, we're going to organise it, we're going to plan it, we're going to improve it, we're going to make it fairer, nicer, better, altogether more wonderful, and we're going to be in charge of it. 
and we're going to sweep away the old. All these higgledy-piggledy little bits of cities, you know, all these muddles and little back streets full of tradesmen wasting almost all their resources, competing with each other, advertising against each other. You know, we're familiar with these arguments as well, aren't we, as libertarians? We know this stuff. I don't have to convince you that, that the modern movement in architecture is... It's a, it's a simplification, as I acknowledged in my discussion of this book. It, it's a simplification, but it, it is fair to say that this is collectivism in concrete. I and mean, this, this is what it is. So that's my third category. And then the last one, I, I've called it starchitecture, which is a word has, that has been in, invented quite recently to describe um, basically cool modern buildings, usually done for corporations by famous name architects like Norman Foster or Santiago Calatrava or um, Frank Gehry, who, who designed that extraordinary concert hall in Los Angeles, which looks, I don't know how you describe it. I, I, this is where I do want to photograph to be showing all this, but, but it, it's, it's all over the place. An amazing, an amazing building. I recommend it strongly to look at. Not at all to everybody's taste, I don't suppose. And those are my four categories. And in many ways, the, the sort of evolving story can be understood as a sort of military manoeuvrings, if you like, between these four tendencies. So the bit that Crozier's theory of modernism didn't really explain was where the hell this had come from, this, this modern impulse. Well, the answer is it had been building up throughout the 20th century, the modern movement impulse. I mean, if I may illustrate the difference, you know I sort of wave my arm like that to describe a classic American city centre skyscraper cluster, and now they're starting to appear in other cities around the world. Australia, for example. Even London is starting to look like that from certain angles. Um, the Corbusian corresponding picture, Le Corbusier, the great Swiss architectural visionary, his picture of what a city should look like was identical towers arranged as if on a parade ground, absolutely at the same height. There's an extraordinary picture in, in one of Le Corbusier's, but this is called The City of Tomorrow. I think in French it was called Vers in Architecture, something like that. I, I may be muddling up different books of his, but there's an amazing picture of his, which is from, it's, it's a picture that is from roof level. And you literally see all these towers exactly lined up with each other. And he is not, that is not something incidental to what he's talking about. That is absolutely the essence of the plan, the organization that is leveling the top of these buildings. He's putting an end to chaos, the market, the, the, the confusion and the complication of city life. That's what he's trying to do, trying to make it grand and simple and splendid. And, at the ground level, lots of wide opens, all these higgledy-piggledy little housey things, gone, swept away. Now, the next he heading I've got here, this is another place that modernism came from. And I've called this the crisis of decoration. In the night, in, before machines were capable of thrashing out decorative brickwork and things of that sort, I think it's fair to say that decoration really meant something. When you saw a highly decorated building, you saw the work that had gone into it. You saw, you, you saw the effort. It's rather like w watching somebody play a piano. Again, forgive the classical music references, but it's a, it's a good example, I think. If you see an individual person playing a piano concerto, part of the excitement of it and part of the meaning of it is that it's very difficult, what he's doing. You know, all these octaves and things like that. And, and definitely built into the piece is the struggle to play the piece. And the piece communicates this struggle. It communicates this sort of human protagonist. Will he manage to play this piece without coming a total cropper? And the same sort of thing, I think, applies to architecture. All right, you know it's not, not likely to fall down in front of you. It's all been done. But you look at, a I don't know, a Gothic cathedral and you think, Good Lord Almighty, look at the work that went into that. Look at the lifetimes of carving and effort and masonry. Look at the, all getting the bricks up there. How did they do it? And geez, they were serious about worshipping God, weren't they? 
and uh, God bless them. You know, that, that, that's, that's what it gets across to you. In the 19th century, you suddenly have factories banging out ornamental brickwork and it stops meaning anything. The people who were doing this thought, now we can do fantastic decoration and we can get the whole dog job done in six weeks or something. But what they forgot was that it, 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 it wouldn't mean anything, or it certainly wouldn't mean so much. And anyway, whether you agree with that or not, whether you, whether you think that, that there was a crisis of decoration and that I'm describing something real, the fact is definitely, it is definitely the case that a great many architectural theorists in Europe at the beginning of the 20th century were of that opinion. One of them wrote a very uh, tellingly entitled pamphlet called, I think, Ornament and Crime. I mean, that's how much they hated it. Their attitude, again, again, whereas I, the, what Le Corbusier did to the ground was a great sweep of the hand, just sort of wiping away this horrible muddle of little houses, same thing vertically on a building. Get rid of it. Clean out, clean all the shit off the surface of the of the building, and let's see the grand, simple shape of the building. That that's what's going on. There's a, there's a sort of puritanism of foot. There's an amazing scene. I mentioned it in the conversation I had with Patrick. There's an amazing scene in Hamlet where Hamlet confronts his mother in her boudoir. She's putting on makeup. He goes into a frenzy of loathing at the whole idea of you primp, you you put paint all over your faces, you lying bitches, you know, that, it's, he gets incredibly wound up. And that is the atmosphere that prevailed among architectural aestheticians in the early part of the 20th century. That was what they thought about decorating buildings. They really, really hated it. It wasn't just an aesthetic issue, it was a moral issue. They wanted this vile practice to stop. And they, they, they had a sort of antagonistic attitude towards the rest of the world, which Patrick, you know, his, his theory gets. But where did it come from? Well, I, I hope I've explained some of it. Um, they, what architects wanted was no longer, no longer really works of art. What they wanted was the result of necessity. One of the big phrases they use, well, we want houses should be machines for living in. In that spirit, they were very envious of the engineers who were constructing actual machines. And one one of the sort of running jokes, to me anyway, of of architectural history at that time, in the early part of the 20th century, was was the way that architects really wanted architecture to be the result of necessity. They wanted form to follow function. They said it did follow function. They kept, it was, they wanted it to be true. They looked at aeroplanes where, you know, an aeroplane, they knew, as we all, I think, are entitled to believe and to assume, that aeroplanes are the shape they are because they have to be. I mean, nobody, nobody when they're demonstrating a new aeroplane to some bunch of air marshals in Whitehall, says, um, here's our new aeroplane. Now, what we've done in design, we've gone back to print, basics and we've said what, what do we mean by an aeroplane how, how could it express it? that's not what happens at all is it we all know that the reason the wings are the shape that way is because that's the way to make it fast and chase after other fighter aeroplanes and kill them that, that everything that happens in an aeroplane is is because of necessity and the architects and this was always true of aeroplanes right from the very first we see these somewhat clunky objects with their sort of bits of piano wire holding them together and sort of almost like fabric or something, I don't know. Um, and we, we think, oh, that's rather antique and quaint. But they, the architects looked on with, 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 with envy, as I say, and they said, that is what architecture should be like. It should be the, a natural consequence of necessity. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a, a, an aesthetic whim. Basically, it shouldn't be star architecture is what it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be Frank Geary saying, well, I, I think that's a cool shape. You know, I like it. It fits in nicely with the way the street happens down there, and I think it just looks good. I am the architect, I say so. Everyone else looks at it, yeah, we think it's cool, let's have that, that's good. Let's, uh, let's spend whatever it costs to get that funny shaped roof, you know. That was anathema to, to, to the modernists. Now, to be fair to Mr Jenks, the man who says it's complicated, 
There was plenty of that kind of weirdness going on at the time. And there was an architect called Gaudi. I don't know if you've seen Barcelona Cathedral, but it is the most fantastically uh, whimsical piece of star architecture you have ever seen. Um, Clearly, somebody very eccentric and persuasive built that because, you know, that doesn't just happen. That, that's not the, the product of necessity. That is the product of... That's, that's a work of art in, in, in the sense that the, the early 20th century theorists were trying to get away from. Uh, ships, architects love ships. They loved trains. They loved cars. They, um, they loved anything which, which uh, seemed to be logical and... Um, necessary and inevitable. They loved anything where form followed function. Uh, tragically, it never does in architecture. Form actually follows fashion. When you look at a building, you can usually date it. You can seldom guess what's going on inside it. Um, you know, one moment it's a railway locomotive shed and the next moment it's the roundhouse where they put on plays. You know, very successfully, very satisfactory. Um, who knows what the National Theatre will be doing in 100 years' time, what will be going on inside it, if it, if it exists. Uh, it's anybody's bed. You won't be able to tell by looking at it what goes on inside it. It could be a great big, uh, some sort of supermarket, maybe it'll be a, a mosque, or, I don't know, who knows? Um, if it has a sign on it, then you'll be able to guess. But just by the shape of it, no chance. Absolutely no chance of guessing. But if you know your architecture, you'll be able to date it. You'll know that's about 1970-something. or You know, that's when those sort of stuff, those buildings were being done. And, and that's true of all architecture. I mean, the bookshop that I, I worked in in Covent Garden used to be a banana warehouse. Now it's a shoe shop. That's typical of architecture. Um, form does not follow function. Function simply moves in. That's how it works. And architects find that annoying. Well, certainly the modernists did, but, but I'm just saying it as a sort of criticism. OK, that's a minor error made by the modernists. Now let me... What, what sort of time have you got in mind to finish this? About, I don't know, 8 o'clock or a bit more? About, about that? Yeah, if you wish, a bit, a bit more if you wish. To OK, go. well, a bit more than that. OK. Well, I've got the clock in front of me, so I can, I can keep a control of myself. But anyway, this is the page dealing with the errors of modernism. And... Um, you know, I, I, did I mention this business of um, sort of going back to basics? No, I don't think I did. It was, it was in the talk with Patrick, but not in this. Um, it, it, it says here, year zero. The idea that designing, that the, the right way to design things is to go right back to, to fundamentals and uh, redesign everything from logical first principles. Um, Whenever I uh, read architectural theorists ranting away about uh, logic and necessity and reason and form following function and so on, I, I find myself thinking also of, a, of another group of people, which was the, the Bloomsbury group, and their attitude towards conventional morals to do with marriage and personal relationships and that kind of thing. They had just the same attitude, which was, if a rule, if you don't know why a rule exists, then forget it. I will only follow rules, said your Bloomsbury intellectual, if you can explain to me why they're a good thing. Now, do I have to say the word Hayek <laughs> in this company? The fact is that a rule can embody a wise procedure even if the person telling you that rule, perhaps it's your grandfather, has no idea why it works. And may even have a completely false idea of why it works. Because if you do follow it, you won't upset God. If you don't follow it, you will upset God. That might be his argument. Uh, so you say to yourself, you're a Bloomsbury intellectual. You say, God, phew, not interested in that. If you're an atheist like me, you might even say that. Uh, and, 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 and you say, well, that's a stupid reason to follow a rule. God can look after himself. I'm going to do it. And then you walk into a world of trouble. The point is your granddad, the person who told your granddad knew that it was a good rule to follow. He couldn't, he couldn't explain it properly, but he knew, he knew he'd experienced what people breaking this rule in the past, and he he'd saw that it was a good rule to follow. His granddad, he couldn't explain it, so he said, God says you've got to do this. You just do it. Do what I say. Um, now, something similar applies to design. 
if you, if, if for example, you say in 1920, right, I want to buy, I want to build a house. And you've got two sorts of people telling you how to build a house. One is a builder. And he says, well, here's how you build a house. This is what a house is. If you're, if you're a modernist architect with that Bloomsbury streak in your, in your thinking, you say, why? Why is it like this? And the builder, he can't explain it. He can't say why that's a good house um, and why this is a bad house. He, he, can't, he can't do it. He, he, he's forgotten. All he knows is that it's a good house, that if you build it like this, it will work well. If you build the windows like this, it will look nice. If, if you put the front door on the front, that will be good. Etc. 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 All sorts of, all sorts of. He, he's just a, he's just inherited this pattern from his boss when he started, who inherited it from his boss when he started, and it works. And the modernists weren't having any of that, and they insisted on redesigning everything. And trust me, if you insist on redesigning everything, you are going to cause grief, you, just as your marriage is going to end up being a maelstrom and mad, madhouse of, of recrimination if you follow the Bloomsbury group rule of not following any rules unless you're completely convinced of their logical necessity. So too, if you insist on redesigning everything, uh, you're going to be in trouble. This explains why those modern, the, the imposed modernist period between 1950 and 1980 was such a weird time because on the one hand these people were orating about form following function and about houses being machines for, for living in but the damn machines didn't work <laughs> you know what was going on it wasn't that they weren't trying to make machines that worked it was that they they had ideas about how to design things which had the result that they weren't going to work i mean let me put it like this. Architecture is damn complicated. Designing a big building means that you have to get a lot of things right. And if you get any one big thing wrong, you've got a disaster on your hands. It's not much of a defense of a building to say, well, yes, but it looked very nice if the roof has just caved in. That's not a successful building. That's naught out of one on that building. Um, if, if you um, design a big hospital, and you, you insist on getting involved in too many, if you design the beds again, you know, redesign them, or you redesign the, you, you have a big quarrel with some, um, you know, the, the surgeon who's helping you design the, the hospital. And he said, well, this is what a ward is like. He said, why, why, why is it like that? Oh, it just always is, that's how it works. Oh, I'm having that, I'm gonna redesign that. You end up screwing up all these things and you also make blunders. You make elementary mistakes. And my favorite elementary mistake to do with hospitals was that somebody, I believe, did build a hospital. I don't know where this happened. It may be a, I need to look it up on Snopes, where um, the beds didn't fit in the lifts. I mean, that's just absolute disaster. That is the roof caving in on a hospital because, you know, they had to rebuild the whole thing. It was just disastrous. They had to sort of a stitch completely different lifts on it that were bigger. It was, it was just a shambles. So. They believed in building machines for living in and for working in and for curing people in. They didn't know how to do it. And that's one of the reasons. It turns out that that anti, that anti tradition that first got its big impetus in their loathing of decoration, which is what they thought of as tradition, it, it, it sort of enticed them into a more fundamental attack on the whole idea of traditional knowledge. And that got them into serious trouble. Even the decoration turned out to have functions that they hadn't foreseen. Decorate, I mean, there's, there's a lovely bit in this book about a, a very early skyscraper, which, because the Americans are sensible people, was very innovative in its structure, but not at all innovative in its outside. They did it just like a regular building. They had frilly little bricks on it, uh, you know, just like it had the department store next to it that was only six stories high. And the moisture was well handled by these frilly little bricks. And uh, the, the person writing this book says, uh, just throws it in as if it was just a coincidence, but that's a very common story. Um, 
if you look at old buildings, you will see that the moisture, it almost is persuaded to behave like makeup. It, it almost accentuates the shapes of the decoration. It, 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 it kind of, it's like, yes, it's like makeup. And if you sweep away all that decoration, where's the moisture going to go? All over the big, blank, grand, simple walls that you put there and you're so proud of. Big smears, big blotches, you know, modern architecture. What can I tell you? That's what happens. Um, so I've got here anti trad design decor. Uh, um, anti trad design decor as damp handling. That's just an example. That's just a for instance of the trouble you get into when you turn your back on how things are usually done. Um, My next heading is called The Infinite Plan. This is, we're now going back to the totalitarian mindset of a lot of these architects. Basically, these people were... They were trying to reshape the whole world. They, they, it isn't an exaggeration to say that a lot of these plans were literally supposed to charge off in all directions. Um, I wonder if I've got time to talk about the meaningless triangle. I, I'll give it a go. Um, I need to draw a picture now. I'll wave it in front of the camera. Don't worry, guys. All you people out there. Um, supposing you have a building site that isn't square, something like this, I don't know, sort of like that, some shape like that. Those are, those are the roads around the edge of the building site. Okay, now you're, you're, a, you're a modernist architect. If you're a star architect, of course, you know, you, you'd build a thing shaped like a giant piece of cheese or something, and you'd have great fun with those shapes. You, you, you'd revel in the oddity of the plan and you, you, you'd, you'd produce a wonderful um, sort of thing like a, I don't know, a piece of sculpture. But you're not one of those characters. You, you hate that. That's capitalism gone berserk, individualism. No, no. What you do is you, you build a, a thing like this. That's your plan, like that. And there we are. That, that's just the shape that the building tends to occupy. I mean, what it might be is something like this, sort of big lump there, another one there, a uh, big building there, perhaps a tower coming up there, another big building, a bit of ribbon development or something like that. You know, the sort of thing. If you look on a, a map of a city, you see this, you know, great big sort of office complexes like that. I mean, a bit like that, not a very good picture. But the point I'm getting at is that, look at this, bizarre little space there. That meaningless triangle. As I say, if an architect was doing this now, faced with that same site, he'd put a wall round the edge. He'd say, yeah, this is where it stops. But the point is, these people weren't interested in stopping. Their attitude towards the rest of the world was one of belligerence. Basically, that was the idea. They were going to attack on all fronts. And as the modern movement disaster became more disastrous, you see, at the first it had been very popular. It, it, seemed to, it seemed to illustrate a whole new socialist world that was going to be great. The propaganda films in Britain in, say, 1945 were often illustrated with modernist Corbusian dreams of, of housing estates. And people thought, well, that, if, it's, if it's going to be better than our horrible little back-to-backs with our outside toilets, well, that's great. Wonderful. Bring it on. So they brought it on. And 20 years later, the, 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 you know, the, the poor sods living in these places were not so happy, to put it mildly. And as they got more angry and grumpy and resentful, the architects became more belligerent. Their first reaction was, we're going to force this on you. We're, we're not, we're not, we're not going to bend. We're not going to sort of, we're not going to be driven back into the world of chaos and market choice and confusion. We're going to, we're going to damn well assert ourselves. And, and, and the, 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 there, was a, there was a school of architecture, a little theory of architecture called the new brutalism, which some, to me sums up this whole mentality that, that, you know, we're going to do modernism, and if you don't like it, we're really going to do it to you, you know. That, that, that's almost what it felt like. And, and that's where, I mean, if you walk just outside this, I walked on the way from Russell Square Tube Station to this building. 
there's a big concrete lump um, with, a, with a huge, great sort of, just a great big fucking object. I don't know what it is, but it's just ugly beyond belief. And, and you can almost feel the, the kind of, that's what you're going to bloody well have. The architect's really getting angry. As I say, 10 years later, they said, we can't be doing this anymore. This is wrong. We know it's wrong. We've got to stop. But there was a moment of almost ferocity. And, and that's where you get these meaningless, meaningless triangles from, because what they're saying is we're not, we're not going to straighten the edge of the building. As far as we're concerned, the edge of the building is a, is a violation of the idea that, that architecture should sort of remake the whole surface of the world. We hate this idea of dividing it all up into little plots. And certainly we hate dividing it up into plots that have been determined by, you know, donkey car people 400 years ago. I mean, what is that about, you know? We should, we should sweep all that away. So, so they actually dislike the kind of weirdness of the shape. And this is their way of refusing to accept it. And so you, you actually see, if you, if you look in London, you will see, and I'm sure it's true in other cities, that you'll see these funny sort of places like that. Um, that that's the edge, that's the plan of, of the edge of, a, of a, something like a department store. Um, you know, where instead of just having a, a shop which is a bit off the rectangle because the street plan is like that, instead they do this. And it, you have this weird bit where they're, 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 it's like a saw or something like that. Very strange. Anyway, that's a, that's a sort of a sideshow. I'm glad I've been allowed enough time to get that in. Here's another strange part of the story, and this time it's rather good news for modernism. That even as modernism was covering itself in, I'd rather not use the word, but you know what I'm getting at, in the outdoors, in the world of architecture, it was succeeding triumphantly indoors. The very same people who were cursing architects for the fact that their lifts didn't work or that the windows were drafty or that the wallpaper was falling off the walls were simultaneously purchasing washing machines and furniture that embodied the modernist attitude. Modernism, the sort of simple, plain, functional, uh, do the job attitude to design was triumphing indoors at exactly the same time that it was um, failing out of doors. I mean, in this room, actually, we can see um, pretty much that sort of thing happening. I mean, if I may, I mean, this is a, this is a beautifully designed piece of modernism. I mean, you you can't see it, you video watchers, but there's a tripod underneath your machine, and it's really well designed, isn't it? Look at it, lovely thing. And then up here, we've got this horrible sort of window thing made out of what? It, it looks it's, it's sort of, it reminds me of something a comedian once said that the word workshop should be confined entirely to light engineering and should never be used for any other, in any other connection. But it's almost as if they're sort of being perversely industrial when they built those, those horrible windows. Don't you think they're ugly? I do. Um, that's kind of the, that, that is a sort of typical piece of outdoor modern architecture forcing itself indoors. But inside here, we have the real thing. We have successful modernism. We have very nice pieces of design which, which work, which do the job. Uh, look at this. This is a nice piece of work. Look at this, this, thing, this, this thing here. That is just very nice functional design. Um, this that I've been using. It's, it's a very nice piece of work, a very sweet piece of work. Uh, no frills, no sort of complications, no, no sort of gothic finery. It's just the basic thing doing the job. This, you know, there it is. This, look at that. Beautifully plain and simple. No messing about. This, very good. And now, why is that? One of, the one of the reasons is that it's very hard doing things out of doors. You have to, especially in a country like this, where you have to worry about the climate. But there's another reason to do with scale. Architects were obsessed with mass production. And just as they were obsessed with um, functionality in buildings, and yet didn't contrive it, so too they were obsessed with mass production, 
and fell flat on their faces in trying to do it. I mentioned a moment ago that, um, perhaps to a feeling of incredulity, that often architects had in mind that they were going to march across the whole surface of the earth with their plans. This is not an exaggeration. They did, they really did produce fantasy plans which did exactly that. Uh, and you can't understand their actual plans unless you realize that that's their mentality. They associated this with mass production. They were going to mass produce houses, mass produce buildings. But of course, mass production is, um, is hazardous. If you produce a very, very big object before you've checked it out and made damn sure it works, and mass produce it before you've done that, you are in a world of trouble. I mean, imagine if the aircraft industry behaved like that. They just produced an aeroplane in a few weeks and then said, right, that looks fine, look at it, great, wonderful. Let's have 300 of those. Disastrous, absolutely disastrous. You have to spend months, years developing an aeroplane, making sure every aspect of it is satisfactory before you start producing lots of them. What you do is you produce one, then you produce a few more, you fiddle around with it, modify it, produce another one, and another, until you've got it, you've really got it right. And then, when you're really sure it's working, you start producing a few more in large numbers. Now, architecture, the bigger it is, the more true this is, is not something that is easy to mass produce. You don't make an identical big building. Yes, you make an identical house if it's a conventional design that you already understand. Those are mass produced in the suburbs, bloody suburbs, you know, <laughs> sprawl, market, consumer choice, we hate it, that sort of territory. Uh, but if you're making a new design, you better be damn sure that you've got it right before you start mass producing it. But compare and contrast a really big object with something like this. Suppose you've produced a glass like that and you think it looks nice, and you go into production with it, mass produce you know, a few thousand of them or something. What's the worst that can happen? Answer, not a very good glass. Turns out it, I don't know, it breaks when you put it in microwaves or something. I don't know, some, some weird thing happens or it, it bangs into your nose when you try and drink out of it or whatever is the problem. Difficult to wash up, can't dry it up very, who knows? Um, Lots of things that the, the original designer won't have foreseen. OK, stop the assembly line. How much money have you lost? A bit, not much. If it succeeds, on the other hand, then the reward for your radically new design in, 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 in whatever it is you've made is tremendous. And so you have the irony of architects who are producing deeply unpopular buildings simultaneously making really quite successful furniture. A lot of the furniture in this room, it is quite possible. Uh, that one strikes me as one particularly of the type, if I may wave that in front of the camera. This looks like, to me, a very architect design sort of thing. Architects get involved in furniture. Uh, and the irony is that their mentality of going back to first principles, trying something radically new, is much better suited to small objects indoors than big ones outdoors. It's a very strange story when you think about it. Um, and some of the most successful chairs of the 20th century have been designed by architects. The famous example is Mies van der Rohe's chair, the Barcelona chair. Beautiful thing. Uh, a collector's piece, you know, the, the first run, as it were, the first edition. People pay incredible prices for those. And that, it's a very, very fine object. Um, beautifully crafted. Um, and it's because of the differential rewards and punishments of, on the one hand, mass producing small objects, and on the other hand, and designing them in a radical way which might be, might be very successful, but is probably not going to be very successful. It's a bad way to design buildings. It's a much better way to design small objects, because if, if a small object is bad, you forget about it, not a problem. If it's successful, brilliant. You've got yourself a runaway hit on your hands. So. Um, that's, that's another of those ironic little stories. I, I need to wrap up quite soon. Um, I, think, I think if I had to sum up the sort of um, reconciliation that maybe, maybe I'm 
being too optimistic here, but maybe being achieved between modern architects and the rest of us about now. It would be in the form of two observations. The first is, I've, I've been talking about trad architecture as if it's very static, but the fact is that traditional architecture keeps on developing. And if you look underneath the surface of a new suburban house, you will find all sorts of technologies going on in there that didn't happen 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. And that's a continuous process. I, I mean, I remember I briefly worked in the building trade myself, and I can remember um, one day a lorry arrived with some roof trusses, which are things like that, you know, timber frames like that, which, and, and they were all lined up on the, on the back of the lorry. And I noticed that instead of being built by putting the timber like that and then nailing it through with individual nails, instead the timber has been attached like that and a new kind of multiple nail had come from nowhere, which consisted of a sheet with a lot of spikes punched out of it. It's quite routine now, but at the time it was, it was quite, a, quite an invention. And then they're sort of banged on the side with a machine. Now, you may say, well, that's, that's a big deal. What difference does that make? Well, it means you can put twice as many of these things on a lorry. And that counts for something. Um, that's just a little example of an innovation that's very helpful. Uh, and, and another thing, you, 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 can, you can fit it in half the... If you want to put a wall next to this truss or something like that, some sort of attic, then the truss occupies half the width. So potentially you've saved a few inches. Okay, it's not a big deal, and that's my point. It's a tiny little evolutionarily useful improvement. And, and the, the, the trad building trade is absolutely crammed with things like that. I mean, for example, um, one of the things that has happened in the 20th century to traditional building has been the invention of cavity walls and all the associated handling of moisture and drafts and things in that. Well, now, the inside cavity wall used to be done with old-fashioned bricks, little things like that. Heavy, uh, cut your hands if you're not careful. Brick layers have to put them up. About, I don't know when it was, but sometime around 1950, they started using breeze blocks. They, they worked around with cement and all that kind of stuff and made much bigger, lighter bricks that were the same depth as regular bricks, but much, much quicker. So you could whistle up the, the inside wall much more quickly and much more cheaply. And it was lighter, and that's important, because if, especially if it's a second floor, you know, lightness in the building is a great advantage because it means you, you don't need so much strength at the bottom to support it all. I mean, that's the original story of, the, of those, those steel frame buildings. You couldn't build them if... You couldn't build with masonry beyond a certain height because... But at a certain point, you've got the ground floor completely solid masonry. Well, this, so therefore, uh, anything which makes building materials that little bit lighter is potentially an advantage. That's just a for instance. And I've called it the tradition, the, the, sorry, the modernity of trad. Underneath this apparently rather sort of e oldy folksy appearance that a lot of suburbs have and a lot of suburban architecture has, there is a hurricane of economic development going on, of, of technological improvement um, that makes it quicker and cheaper uh, and better uh, to, to live in these houses. And the other, of course, is the tradition of modernism. You see, what, what, ha what Patrick's period of reconciliation after the, the, the imposed modernist disaster, what that's about is the modernists saying, well, we still want to do cool buildings. We still think that, uh, you know, we're not, just, we're not just gonna revert to building St Pancras Railway Station, which is a fantastically ornate piece of late 19th century brickwork, by the way. Um, we, we, we still want to do modern buildings. We still want to do the gherkin, but we, we acknowledge that, that we must make it work. And, and the architectural practices that thrived, that emerged out of the modernist disaster, were the ones who weren't so disastrous, so to speak. That they were the ones who, who, whose walls didn't get quite so horribly stained, um, whose buildings seemed to be popular, not just with other architects who gave them awards, but actual punters. 
I mean, the gherkin is a huge popular success. I mean, it, in, uh, in London now, you see posters sort of saying, come to London, have a good time. Picture of Big Ben, picture of the wheel, picture of St. Paul's, picture of Tower Bridge, picture of the gherkin. If that isn't a popular hit, I don't know what is. Something's happened. And what's happened is that these guys have just got better at doing it. They, they, they got better at making buildings that look good. And uh, there's a whole sub-story involving what they meant by beauty. I mean, going back to that rant about decoration that, that they, they used to do in the, in the early part of the 20th century, these people actually, actually tried to redefine beauty to mean what we say it means and what the rest of us mean by ugliness. I mean, they, they actually did talk like that. That's where the new brutalism came from. I mean, they thought that was a good thing. New brutal, hell, what's that about? Well, what it's about is that they were redefining beauty. Well, that they have quietly set to one side. They have said, yeah, we, we agree, you're right, that, um, you know, cool modern buildings are pretty much what you people have been telling us they are. You know, we, we started reading Dan Dare comics and what, looking at the covers of science fiction books, and we agree, you're right, this is what this stuff looks like. Um, and, and it's getting better. Uh, I've missed out lots of things. I knew I would. I, I said in the pre-publicity this was going to be a gallop. It's been a gallop and it's gone on too long already. I will end with a question which, as libertarians, I really hope we all think about. And that is, what, would a, what, it, what do we guess a libertarian world would architecturally look like? What would it be like? Because don't forget, those communists achieved a lot of success with their great visionary manifestos, copiously illustrated. We don't do that. It's a bit of a sham. We don't tend to illustrate our utopias with architectural, with an alternative architectural attitude. And I can tell you right away, they won't be towers all the same height. That's, that's for damn sure. It'll be much, something much more like, a, almost like a vegetation, like New York, Hong Kong. But I think we, could, we can even look, we could even do better than that. We could imagine better things even than those semi-libertarian outbursts of creativity that have happened. Uh, I hope so. Uh, look, I could go on forever, but architecture itself doesn't ever come to any convenient stopping point. Um, and this talk, which is basically me trying to keep track of everything, therefore, similarly, has, is just something that I have to stop rather than end with a wonder, again, with the classical music, a giant chord in C major. It, it never comes to a triumphant conclusion in architecture. There's always more buildings going up. Um, and uh, I'm just going to keep watching. And I, I hope that I've persuaded you that that's an interesting thing to be doing. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Is there any questions or comments? David? Brian, as it's sort of picking up your last question, but, but not entirely. I, I think you sort of missed out part of the story there, which is that you, I mean, you alluded to it various times, but uh, if you take the thesis that the, there was a period when things went very, very badly wrong, you said, well, what, why was that? Uh, and, you, and you sort of briefly mentioned socialism and then didn't really say much more about it. But, I mean, the, the key difference between the sort of evolving mm -hmm. trad architecture and even the, the very modern architecture of things like the Gherkin is that in a very loose sense, you've got private consumers. Yeah. You've got consumers who are, uh, and you've got architects who therefore have to make what people actually want. Mm. And you, if you look at the bad period, it's not entirely gone, but it's not quite, quite as bad as it was. Uh, the, the, the key feature of it, the generally, the, the, the common feature, is stuff being built by people who were spending other people's money, high government, states, local councils, etc., etc., government departments, and building it for people who were basically serfs. Victims. Yeah, Victims. rather than consumers they or were, choosers. They, they, yeah. they were called tenants, but they were 
in any real sense tenants, they were just people who were in there. And so you've got a producer who is not constrained by consumers, and you haven't got any consumers. Uh, and I sort of wonder whether is it any surprise, given that setup, that the result is, is a, 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 a complete disaster. Uh, and I'd actually go further and, and say that, that I, I think that's really the main cause of why there was such a disastrous period in architecture. Because it's a recipe for disaster. If, if, if you had things, if you had washing machines that were being made by designers working for the government, producing them for people who weren't buying them in shops but were just being given them and sort of doled out. The Trabant. Exactly. Trabant Eastern washing European cars. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and well, you're, am I on you're the, absolutely uh, correct. I disagree with nothing you've just said. I thought I had kind of alluded to it in the sense that, you see, the, the, what it, often architects themselves say these kinds of things. They say we were but the victims of circumstances. But the sense in which that's not true is that the architects in their earlier period were the progenitors of this very process of collective ownership. I mean, I think I did make it pretty clear that private ownership was one of the victims of the modernist vision. That was absolutely intrinsic to how they were going to rearrange the world. Um, but if I didn't say what you've just said. Partly it was because I didn't want to just give the usual libertarian talk. I wanted to talk architecture and not just consumer choice and Soviet Union boo and all this sort of stuff. Um, but partly, yeah, you're right. I just, I just maybe should have, should have paused and slammed those points home. Yes, I sit corrected. Um, how much is it something that, as you say, they got it wrong? How much of the ideology, of the idea that um, people were only selfish and bourgeois and looking after themselves because of the market order or the atomization of um, commercial society, and that once we have these grand plans, grand schemes, or we have the new men and women to fit, therefore the idea of having defensible space, um, not, build, not having buildings where it's easy to beat someone up or rob them out of sight of everyone else every ten paces, some of these, or having escape routes for those who flee on foot where cars can't pursue them. They were almost, they were almost designed to be perfect for these purposes, and yet, and yet they were built. And they, it was pointed out to them, you pointed it out yourself, and the authors who wrote about it, depends on the idea of a defensible space, and the idea that the, the twitching lace curtain next door, I mean, in a modern Vic, in a Victorian street, everyone could see the street. Yes. You had no business to stand still outside these houses. Yes. You were going somewhere, you should go somewhere. What's he doing over there? What's he doing? Jane Jacobs, boys. Yes, Jane yes. Jacobs. Jane Jacobs, and another one was called Alice Coleman. I think she also yes. wrote she, it. She, 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 she yes. counted the piss stains in the mm. stairwells. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, just, this is just <laughs> another just of the, the ways steps. in which these, these designers um, cocked it up. You know, this is just another... It's just more detail of the disaster, yes. Um, but the mayor thought but, that people but, won't but, be young. Um, but on yes, that, you're on right. That mentality. You're right that there was an amazing overestimation of the way that architecture can mould character. Mm. That's true. There was. There was a lot of that sort of talk. In rather the same sort of way that um, form follows function, so too they believe that character follows architecture. And the, the one would lead on to the other. Um, and, and they were wrong. Yeah, um, I, I, don't, I think it's important, though, to, to notice that what that also means is that housing estates are not just art disasters because of bad architecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cannot blame the architects entirely for it. Some people do want to do that. But that is to fall into the same mm, yes. fallacy. Uh, the, the sort of bad architecture causes bad character. It's oh, not true. No. Uh, if you go to Eastern Europe, it easier, like, if you go to Eastern Europe, what you find is bad architecture full of good people because they couldn't afford a welfare state, they couldn't afford to corrupt the working classes and turn them into the underclass, uh, they, they couldn't afford to bribe people to become um, paupers. And so they had good people living in these architecturally very off-putting places. And they were better places for it. They weren't ideal. But they, they were clearly designed by the same people as designed the horrible housing estates in, in, in Britain. 
but they weren't as bad. And that's another example of how architecture doesn't guarantee a particular kind of person just because you live in it. Uh, and you're right, that, that's a very important point. Oh, on a, on a parallel point, I suppose, there was a vogue about the same time, late Victorian, Edwardian, 20th century, for um, having new rational languages. We could all speak one language. Yes. It would all make sense. Of course, you have to be living whilst you're changing your language in the same way that there is a tradition, there are the way things look, there is a, what is this building for? Where is the front? Where is the back? Where is the tradesman's entrance? We had a way of reading a street, reading a house, to know, to know where to go and what it was for. And as you say, although it should have been obvious, since the, the form would follow the functions, since you knew the function of the place you were going to, it was a concert hall, it's, sort of this, it's a waste depot, you'd be able to tell it, which of course you, you couldn't. But it is rather like the idea of, whilst using a language, to get rid of that language and replace it with another one. Well, it's, it's this sort of rationalist return to ground zero, which is not rational, actually. But it, well, it's not sensible, anyway. Maybe rational, but it's stupid. <laughs> um, by the way, I never mentioned Ayn Rand. I might have. Fountainhead. Uh, the Fountainhead. Well, I mean, this is going to put the spanner out of the frying pan into the pigeons or whatever. I don't think there's anyone um, around who's spread Ayn Rand now, is there? <laughs> I've said Ayn Rand. I've got to say what I think. I think Ayn Rand's attitude to architecture is at least as much part of the problem as it is part of the solution, put it that way. I, I strongly suspect that quite a few of the buildings designed by Howard Rourke would have been dynamited by the local council because they would have been very unsatisfactory, as similar buildings were dynamited. Trust those collectives so the council to do that. It's a, it's a, but to be more serious, it seems to me that Rand falls headlong into the Bloomsbury Group era of not respecting... Um, unjustifiable tradition, unarguable tradition, or certainly unargued tradition. She's very much the rationalist in a bad way, that I've just, you know, as in rationalist and stupid. Her, it's very interesting that Howard Rourke, the architect hero of the Fountainhead, gets a lightning tour of all the building trades, all of them. Why? Because he has to be omniscient. That's why. Because when he builds a building, it's brilliant. We're told it's brilliant, so it has to be. But how does he know enough to make a brilliant building from, from basic Randian principles? If he's turned his back on, on you know, old-fashioned mumbo-jumbo uh, assumptions and recipes, traditional recipes, um, he has to be omniscient. But of course he can't be in, in the real world. Ar architects can't be. I mean, one of the good things that happened in architecture now is that architects are, you know, you can't interview an architect without him using the word collegiate to describe the process of making a building. It, it involves bringing in lots and lots of professions who all have the veto on the building, not just the engineer who says, it's going to fall down if you build it like that. I'm sorry, I'm not going to sign those drawings. But acoustics experts and heating engineers and... The, lighting and you know they're just an amazing number of areas of expertise and why do you have all these people descending on a single building because so much knowledge has to be de deployed successfully to make a successful building um yeah uh, rand for me doesn't do it which well, doesn't like um, rembrandt and bad sign it's it, it's by the way there are other Signs. She's very scornful of good manners, I think. Don't you? Is, am I right? It's a long time since I've read Rand, but she's... she's uh, anybody who sort of evades an argument by being polite and, and also a bit dishonest, telling a white lie, Rand's got no time for that sort of thing. Uh, as I recall, Galt and Rourke are both um, uh, blunt to the point of rudeness. Uh, and it's almost like a plain, it's the, the, architect, the architectural equivalent is a plain blank wall. Uh, well, build plain blank walls and you may regret it. Answer people by just saying no, and you may regret that for reasons that you hadn't foreseen. I think he didn't, does he? I think he didn't. I mean, the, the, 
the notoriety of modern architecture is, is not entirely, but mostly and almost entirely associated with the council house block. Actually, I would contest that. So, I think in the in the fifties and sixties there was some pretty dire commercial yeah, office building. I don't building. think it. I don't think you can equate it with that. I mean, um, I remember walking down High Street, the High Street of I think Staines, seeing what was it's replaced. Not as bad as it sounds, Staines. It was then. Uh. It was. It was becoming very like that, um, and and commercial office buildings for, for the high street were pretty dreary as well. Uh, they would have done better to just find the grandson of the person who designed the rather ornate looking brick thing and say, do us another. It would have been better, I think. But, but th those, I, uh, to me, there's nothing more dispiriting almost than, than, a, than a, a rather small building um, tricked out to look like a giant office block but uh, it's, it's sort of four stories high and made of dreary concrete and horrible sort of like windows like this you know <laughs> I, I, I think it's important to realise that there was a kind of um, that some of the bad thinking that, that clearly as you say ran riot in the public sector also didn't cover itself in glory in the private sector either um, by the same token I think that now you're starting to see public sector buildings which are really rather impressive. And why? It's because architecture has changed for the better. That's if I'm right. Um, you're quite right that, that the public sector puts in place all sorts of temptations to do stupid things. But the architects were, were begging to do these stupid things when, when it first started. Indeed, they had... They had contributed so much of the fuel to the demand that these stupid things, that, that there should be a public sector in housing. That was an architect's idea in the first place. It's, it's a complicated story. <laughs> Gavin? Yeah, in the, in the six, early 60s, some of the big buildings that were designed were designed as a matter of urgency to replace the rundown blocks in Southwark and Lambeth and place the middle. So, and they are, I don't see anything wrong with them because if they, the same buildings were in Chelsea, they'd be luxury flats. They were very well built, mm. solidly built, and there's no two ways about it. But they ran them down, some of the people that then came as managers in all of these councils, ran them down, and now they want to run them down to the ground and build lower buildings, which is also going to cost more for housing. A point I... I perhaps didn't mention, maybe this leads on from what you've just said, is that tower blocks are actually not the biggest problem with the modernist project. The real problem is what happened at ground level. It's those public open spaces between the towers that have been such a spectacular failure. Often the towers themselves are reasonably satisfactory. After all, the modernists did not invent the tower block. They took it and said, this is how you should deploy it. But they did invent another kind of building, which actually is more like this, if you look on the cover of that. That's a, these, these, these funny sort of ribbon things, they invented those. If it hadn't been for modernism saying we should build those, I don't think they would have happened. Um, there's a huge housing estate in Sheffield called Park Hill, which I particularly remember because one of the architects I worked with when I was a student of architecture, um, uh, was one of the designers of, the, of Park Hill. And uh, that's where you, Bob was talking about uh, rat runs for criminals. That, that's where all that came from. Um, those buildings wouldn't have been made at all if it hadn't been for modernism saying, let's do that. Um, but the sort of things you're talking about, I believe, are much, much more resembling regular buildings. Yes, yeah. Um, they may look a bit different, yeah. but, but the, the basic shape of them is the same. And, and they were well built. Mm -hmm. They were built for a purpose to house working people mm -hmm. who were previously living in rundown flat, uh, flats and semi detached places and, and uh, what you would call terrace houses. Which had no bots, some of them had tin yeah, bots. Yeah, absolutely. So they, they served the purpose and they shouldn't be run down at random. And the Labour government at that time was Wilson's government, and I think they did a good job. 
I disagree with you. I, I, I think that I think you're right that that a lot of these buildings could easily be rescued by being managed differently. I think that's yes, true, yes. Def, and that especially means the tower blocks. Yeah. But I think to go back to my question at the end, what would a, what would an architecturally libertarian world look like? I think that the big changes would be in the big housing estates. See, you're not. I don't think you're talking about big housing estates, are you? No, no, I'm talking. I'm talking about big oh, you housing are? estates, mm. which are built like pigeonholes. But they serve the purpose and they house thousands and thousands of people. And then trying to knock them down now. And, and uh, they don't well, replace them. It's in the building. Because there are a lot of people still on the housing list, more so on the Labour Councils or Labour Councils. Well, we have a dissenter from Crozier's theory of architecture. That's very interesting. Yeah, then, then I think. I think. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear you've had a good experience with, with modernist architecture, but, yeah, but a lot of people... for the GLC. Yeah. Oh. She worked for the Department of Mechanics and Electricity. I draw a pension from there. Well, it's certainly yeah. true if they're well-made and well-maintained, well-managed, and people behave, yeah. and those that don't are moved along, yeah. which used to be the case. I mean, if you didn't pay your rent, you were out. That, was, that used to be a, a principle, even in council flats. Yes. I mean, if that's done, that's fine. But if the lifts don't work and the stairwells are not cleaned and mm -hmm. yeah. because the so same type of flats in Chelsea are now luxury flats, mm -hmm. they yes. have knocked them down, they yes. improved them, repainted them, yes. all that, yes. with marble tiles and all that, and they're luxury flats with the average person can't afford. Mm -hmm. well, uh, although the buildings may have got better, the planners are still with us, of course, mm. and um, so the buildings might be good, but they're probably far too small, and um, they're not not in the countryside where you might rather like to have a house. So um, what effect, what, what are the great, what is the ideology at work here now? Not quite the same one, I, more, perhaps more of a green one, more of an environmentalist one, but, the, but the, the opposition to sprawl and the idea that you should be near where you work, as if people weren't anyway. And then, then, well, they got rid of the idea of living where you, near where you well, work. Well, I, so I, I think another big question to ask is supposing that the green belt had never existed as an idea. The green belt for the vast international audience <laughs> perched behind that video camera, uh, is is a great big swathe of, frankly, meaningless potato and cabbage fields all around London. Um, and I think it's wildly excessive. Um, I, th I think there should be large areas of greenery, but I don't see any problem with having big fingers of, of suburban sprawl dividing it up into, into parks. I mean, I actually think the London parks are much better because they're so near to lots of people, and lots of people will use them as parks. Um, the, the, the green belt seems to me a, an agriculturally superfluous and recreationally void gap. I don't get it. I mean, I get why they did it, because, you know, I've read books explaining that this was a brilliant idea and all that, but I, I don't think it is. And is that the sort of thing you meant? Mm. Um, I, think, I, I think this is all part of my question, what's a libertarian world going to be like? Because clearly a house which is quite near to a park becomes more desirable than a house that isn't. So how do we contrive that collective good that is a piece of public greenery which people seem to like? Um, you know, living near Wimbledon Common is more popular than living just stuck in a lots and lots of houses. So how do you arrange that? How do you make it happen? All to do with restrictive covenants, all that kind of thing. So well, I, guess the, I guess you kind of put things like the late 18th and early to mid 19th century garden squares, mm. which mm. were the products of entirely private developments, but mm. they didn't try build end to end. You still had these the mm. very, very pretty squares, mm. which were, because that's what consumers wanted. So that's what the Developers built, mm. so it, it, it wouldn't be wouldn't be that hard to, to contrive. I mean, we live now in a uh, rented apartment block type thing, and there are lots of green areas there because it sends up the rents. It, sends it up does up seem to me. Prices. I live in a leasehold flat, which seems to me a crazy system. I would much rather that there were no tax advantages to ownership and leasing, that, that renting was 
just as advantageous financially as ownership. Because there are lots of buildings where if, if, you, could, if you could rent it and if you could leave when you didn't like it and find somewhere else quickly, that would mean you were putting real commercial pressure on the place. Um, whereas a leaseholder, you, you often feel you're trapped in a, you know, and paying another whole whack of council attack, tax to the, to the owner of the, of the building. Just make it a level playing field in terms of whatever kinds of property right arrangements yeah. people... I, I, I believe that in a in libertarian world, renting would be much more common than it is in Britain at the moment. So are there any restrictions at the moment? I thought they got rid of Mara. I think they got rid of some of them. They've, they've, they've reduced the overwhelming pressure to be an owner of property a bit, I think. Yeah, is, is that right? Yeah, but you have to sort of stand back from that and say, if you live in a world of fiat currency and constant red inflation, mm. that's bound to be a drive towards owning property, particularly in areas where there's not going to be any more made. Because it's it is. But if you if you didn't have tax advantages to ownership of the place you lived in yourself, and tax punishments for renting where you live it yourself, then you could own property without necessarily living in it, yes. couldn't you? Yeah. You could invest in property if you thought that was a solid investment right. without necessarily having to live in it. Yes. Well, lots of people have gone buy to let. That's well, they've had to. Find <laughs> they've had to. <laughs> they, just, they can't. They can't sell them. So my taxes. understanding is that the overwhelming pressure to be an owner of your house, if you could possibly do it, has lessened in recent years in Britain. Is that right? I think that's right, isn't it? But it's still it's there. Yeah. Well, it's probably it's, been it's, it's, very, it's embedded into the culture, mm. I think, mean, nowadays. Mm. The culture changes when the incentives change, I think. Mm. Of course, Richard. Mm -hmm. Well, it should have changed. Like, I'm pretty sure they abolished... Morris was a big thing in the 80s, but it, I'm sure it was abolished by about 2000, so... Mm. There's also fear of, of rent control coming in. Which, Isn't there something to do with tax relief on mortgage, mortgage interest? No, yeah, not, not anymore. Oh, not anymore. Not yeah. 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 No, I, 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 I think it's that people see property as the modern equivalent of almost gold. It's, just, it's an inflation hedge. Mm -hmm. And there's some truth in that. And you can buy it on, in debt. <laughs> when you're in debt. <laughs> and have that inflation, inflation hedge. Hedge. God. Yeah. More than the inflation hedge, you actually gain... Ooh. Yeah, 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 it's probably true. Yeah. Is there anyone else who wants to ask? Patrick? I wanted to ask a question about decoration. You're talking about decoration, the modern architects didn't like it. But it hasn't come back. I mean, they're, they're, the buildings are prettier, but they're prettier by the sort of basic design, not by sort of making little fiddly spandles. And well, they're, they're smuggling decoration in. One of the ways they're doing it is by having what looks like structure, but is actually structure as decoration. You see a lot of that. Yeah. Mm. There's a hell of a lot of it in the USA. I noticed when I went to uh, what, Chicago. decoration? Decoration under skyscrapers, they are. Oh, yes. The modern skyscrapers yes. are now decorative. Mm. In comparison, and they, start, they stand out starkly to the older skyscrapers. Say, so since about, well, well what's right, the, what's the, the decoration the like in the 80s? Well, um, that's a rib. There's, there's a whole distinct style of doing steelwork to support glass yes, facades, yes. which is done with sort of very... They look really expensive to me. Um, and, and it is. It's like decoration smuggled in through the back door. You're right. They haven't said, oh, screw this, let's just get giant murals painted on it right from the start. Um, there was a little moment when I saw a bright yellow um, staircase outside the National Theatre on the South Bank, and I thought, oh, good, they're going to brighten this place up at last. But years later, still only the one little bit of yellow. I thought that this might be the moment when, when modernism would be um, kind of uh, jazzed up into something different, you know, surface decoration. There's less damp yeah. concrete, I think. Yeah. yeah. Jeremy? Yeah. There's an example of a new building behind Centre Point there, where they've put these horrible garish plastic panels mm. on the outside of the building, different colours on the buildings next to one another. Yeah, they, it, they it like that. Ju it just looks cheap and nasty, to yes. my mind. Yes, yes. Mm. Well, at least they're, they're admitting that 
a kind of gratuitously visual theme could be stitched onto the outside, which is a step in Patrick's direction, isn't it? Yeah. And the next step would be to say, yeah, now let's have something that really looks good mm. instead of tacky, instead of like a warehouse next to a motorway. Um, so they, they are moving in that direction, but it takes time. You, it takes a long time to learn how to do these things. It's difficult. I mean, I mean if, if, I, if I'm only allowed one more thing to say, I'd say architecture is difficult. It's, if there were an architect here, I can imagine an architect sitting there saying, oh, it's bloody easy for you people to criticise. Do you know how hard it is to do? Do you know how hard it is? You do everything right, you get one thing wrong and you never hear the last of it. You know, it isn't easy doing architecture. One of the reasons I gave up. I couldn't do it, it wasn't good enough. None of this stuff, that all came later. I just wasn't good enough, I wasn't clever enough to keep track of it all, any more than I could play a piano concerto. <coughs> Anyone else, Bob? Anyone else wants to talk? Oh, well, thank you very much indeed, Brian. It's marvellous talking to you.